And so if you are so inclined, find yourselves into a position that feels comfortable enough to practice for the next half an hour or so. And I'll guide us through the meditation tonight. And we can practice right away, even before we so-called start. We can practice feeling into what is needed and allowing our instincts about how to take care of ourselves come to the fore. So we want to find a position for the body that feels comfortable enough to practice. And that might be different for each of us. So you can take the time that you need to adjust and experiment even. When the body feels safe enough to be here, the heart can rest in the present moment. So it's fair and good to take a minute to attend to the needs of the body. Maybe another blanket for the feet. Or a slight adjustment of the hips. Or maybe there's some developing confidence that I can do this. The body feels good enough. And we can just take that in. This is what confidence is like. We don't need a lot. Just a little bit. The Pali word for confidence or faith is sada. Just enough to help this heart be interested in presence. And when the heart is confident enough to be interested in presence, then we're simply exploring what it means to be human. We're not doing any special Buddhist meditator moves. Just really pragmatic. What's it like to be me right now? Okay, I've got this body. We've got this heart. And it feels like this right now. I'm not forcing or demanding anything. I'm not trying to attain a beautiful mind state. I'm simply learning how to rest in presence. 
This is what it's like. Can I be okay with this? Can I be okay with this body, this imperfect body, with this heart, this complicated heart? Okay, with all the various emotions and thoughts. Ambiguous mind states. You don't even have to figure them out. You're just sort of like, oh yes. It's like this. Can this be okay? You might notice already that just with a few minutes of intentional practice, you might feel like it's natural, it's more natural to be present. And this reality is of course lawful this is what happens. The mind develops a habit of presence. The whole system develops a habit of presence. And that's what we might call samadhi or continuity of awareness. You can taste what that's like right now. We're cultivating or developing the strength of habit to be present. We're strengthening presence right here with the ordinary. And if it feels terribly unpleasant, You might just take a deep breath or place your hand on your heart and without a demand at all, just ask, can this be okay right now? And you might even ask with some love in your voice. Oh, sweetie. It's hard to be me. Can this be okay? No need to be afraid to give yourself what you need. We're learning how to take care of ourselves. 
doing a sort of reparenting move. Everything belongs. And as we continue with our practice, we might be surprised at what we learn about ourselves. Like I didn't know how many planning thoughts flew through the mind, or I didn't know how this body carried so much tension from the day. I didn't know it'd be so easy to rest. This is what we might call insight. It develops in this very natural way, this lawful way. With persistent interest, developing habit of presence, and beginning with just a dash of confidence. Relieving ourselves of the burden of pressure to become a calm person, or a good meditator, or a wise person. That's just extra, unnecessary, not needed. All we need to do is know what it's like to be human. What's it like right now, and can this be okay? And we'll continue in silence now.
and opening your eyes and coming back into the room with everyone else. Thanks for your practice, everyone. And sometimes you'll see us at Common Ground or pretty regularly at the end of a sitting period or at the end of a program, just put our hands together like this. And this is a gesture called Anjali. And it uh, it's just a way of honoring the time that we've spent together and honoring the sincerity of practice in each of us. So if it feels right, you can do that. If it doesn't, it's not a requirement. <laughs> So feel free to stretch your body and have a drink or whatever you need to do. And also take a minute to look around and say hello to folks. If you feel comfortable, you can turn on your video. You don't have to, but just for a moment to wave and smile and say hey. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Chuck. Using the chat is great too, if you'd like to say hi that way, connect. Yeah, it's totally fine to do that even through the talk, if you'd like to participate by using the chat. <clears throat> we have to really get good and of using these, the ways that we have to connect with each other. Curious if anyone is here for the first time. If you'd like to, you can just unmute yourself and say hello, say your name and what pronouns you use if you'd like. Working through a book um, called Listening to the Heart, a contemplative journey to engaged Buddhism by uh, two wonderful teachers, Kitty Saro and Tanisara. And you don't need the book. Every, you don't even need to know where we are in the book. Every Wednesday night will have will be its own teaching. Um, but if you are following along in the book, we're at the end of chapter eight and the beginning of chapter nine. Yeah. And there's this wonderful uh, little story that I think about often, it comes to mind um, just, you know, regularly for me. And it's a story that I heard Gil Fransdahl tell one time. Gil is a teacher in California. Um, it's a story about a teacher named Suzuki Roshi. And it's just like a very simple story where the student of Suzuki Roshi's uh, during a teaching said to him something like, if I practice the way you're instructing me, will I become enlightened? And Suzuki Roshi said, if your practice is sincere, it's almost as good. And so just that, I don't know if you feel that resonance like I do, but just that sincerity of practice is, you know, just the fruit of the path. We pave this path by walking it. You know, it might be another way to say it. And that it's not so much a destination of where we are going, you know, like towards enlightenment or something like that, but actually this reality of living into what it means to be human and finding freedom right here. Not finding pleasantness, but finding freedom from needing things to be a particular way. When we investigate the teaching of emptiness, a shift starts to take place, a transformation from me thinking about my life in the world to receptivity that listens and is aware. We begin to notice what comes and goes, 
we start to recognize the reality of unmoving heart of the unmoving heart that regist registers the appearance and disappearance of conditions. From this perspective, rather than me moving through life, in actuality life is manifesting, dissolving, and then being recreated with the f within the field of awareness. It's mysterious how the myriad appearances of the world constantly come into creation. We can understand and investigate these creations because of awareness. So keeping that initial story in mind about how important it is to just find some sincerity in our practice as we move through and understand the depths of the Buddhist teachings. And so I'll continue tonight talking a bit about emptiness. And this is one of the central teachings in Buddhism, and it's a teaching theme that runs through all of the schools of Buddhism. And in some schools, this is one of the most profound understandings that we can come to. When we consider emptiness, so it's good to just invite this attitude of mind right from the beginning, this attitude of sincerity in our learning. So even if this teaching on emptiness doesn't resonate right away or for a long time, then we find some joy in the seeking, right? in the quality of our intention to try to understand and to see what it means. And that's really like seeing what it means to be human and allowing the wisdom to grow with time and with practice, but not with force or demand. And I say this because emptiness often has a very different association for us. And it can often come with some negative connotations. Like when we think about emptiness, sometimes we think about like being empty of something positive or empty, we kind of feel blah. But there's this little story and the Buddha asked um, his one of his um, main disciples, Sariputta, like, what were you doing on this one occasion? And Sariputta said, I was, sir, I was abiding in emptiness. And so in this real simple way, we can see that abiding in emptiness was something useful. And so we want the teaching to be something useful, right? Not something, it's not meant to be a teaching that brings us down or strips something away from us or sucks the life out of us or something like that. All of a sudden, to be a Buddhist practitioner means you have to like flop around and like, ma, 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 you know, life is empty empty of any joy, of any vibrancy. It's not like that at all. It's this, the depth of the teaching is really meant to inspire and not just inspire, but, um, but free up space in the heart for engagement, for compassion, for that vibrancy to be here, right? It frees up our capacity to be alive with each other, to be available to meet each other, to find our way into some deeper belonging. So when we invite this, we invite the beneficial attitudes to be with us, we just, you know, simply aspire to show up as a learner and see what happens. So when I think about emptiness, I was talking with my partner this morning and about emptiness and um, like what is just kind of like what does it mean to live into a sense of emptiness right now? And this is, I think, you know, for me, one of the uh, beauties of this practice is that we get to explore all of the depths of the teachings right in the midst of our daily lives right in the midst of our relationships with our friends and our loved ones at work and community and the world just the way that it is. And so in this moment, I was really curious, like, what does it mean? What is emptiness like right now? And we had, you know, I just like was playing around with my body and started to 
move a little and dance, you might say, but it was just very silly and slight. And she said, yeah, I think that's it right there. And I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Isn't there something better than that? But I actually, you know, thought about that quite a lot today and really tried to live into this, the depth of this understanding. And I think that's right. I, and I think somehow this body, this constitution knew that when I started to just move a little bit, like emptiness is the spaciousness to belong, right? To not have to reject any part of who we are. So it's like this radical sense of yes, or belonging to life. And not because, you know, that's just some feel good idea, but because it's actually really deeply true. And so the, the heart of this teaching on emptiness involves this understanding that all of who we are is true. You know, it's not like it could be any other way. And we came this way, we became who we are lawfully based on our experiences with people in our lives and the conditions of our lives and the environment the way that it is all of these experiences shaped us and so every bit of our personalities every identity that we have has arisen has we have come to that it has shaped us into this being as a force of nature like every Identity is a force of nature. And it all, all of, all of this comes from somewhere. So it's actually pointing to the sense of interconnected causality. And we can understand that in a real intellectual way, or we can understand it in a real practical way. Like, ah, oh, right, I can see how the sun melts the snow and supports the growth of the grass in the spring. Like, I can see how the conditions come together and change our reality. I can see how growing up the way that I did sort of shaped the way I think about life. I can see how moving about as a queer, uh, non-binary person and the experiences that I have actually shapes the way I think and the way I feel and my degree of safety in the world. Right? So all of this is true and a force of nature. And some of the conditions are really visible to us and obvious, and some of the conditions are invisible to us. So this is the part of the understanding too, like I don't completely know why I wanted to move my body the way I wanted to move my body, right? But that was shaped by many, many things. Coordination and comfort at moving my body and maybe previous experience with music and practice, years of practice, and some forces unknown to me, right? Historical, genetic, perhaps ancestral, throughout time, you know, what has been handed down, what I have absorbed, either knowingly or unknowingly. And some of the forces that we absorb and are invisible to us are uh, some cultural aspects of living here in the West, like consumerism um, is an obvious one or values of domination and superiority can often go unnoticed in moments and not unnoticed in every moment and certainly not un unnoticed for all of us in some moments. But the forces that what, what the Buddha is pointing to in his teachings, all of the teachings is from this point, from a, a Buddhist point of view is the way mind shapes experience the way mind shapes our external experience right? so we can see how 
um, this path that we're on to cultivate presence is directly related to our capacity to live skillfully with each other. And although it might be difficult to wake up to the invisible forces, we can at least honor them as a starting point. We can receive them as mysterious conditions and we can continue to walk and practice and learn and see where that takes us to see how far we can with some sincerity, deepen our understanding. One of the things that makes this time so difficult is that for us is that uh, it really seems like as a collective, we're waking up to some of the more difficult realities that we're living with. And one of those realities is this reality of our own mortality. We can all, you know, that's front and center with us day in and day out as we're living in the pandemic, for example. And it can, we might think like, oh yeah, I'm not afraid to die, or I know I'm going to die, or I know I'm aging, or I understand something about how the body gets sick. But this is a real deep reality that can kind of rock us in moments when we're faced with the, oh my God, I don't know when that is going to be, or if that's coming, or I don't know if that's, you know, this uncertainty around death, health, sickness is all around us. I was walking my dog today, my trusty companion, uh, and I came across a squirrel that was uh, dead in the middle of the road. And I noticed for a moment this repulsion, like I didn't want to look at it. I didn't want to notice this dead life form that was here. And just this, you know, awareness that, oh, this is living deep inside of me. This interest or this um, instinct to turn away from death or to actually find it repulsive. You know, I wasn't actually proud that that was what arose for me in this moment. It would be a lot more easy to sit here and go like, oh yeah, I saw a squirrel, a life form that was dead and the heart broke open with compassion, but it's not the first thing that arose in my heart. And so this moment, like there was this interesting moment where I could recognize that and lean into it. So I did, I got a little closer and I just stood there and watched the various nuances of mind states of heart places come and go. And it wasn't repulsion that stuck, but that repulsion to turn away from the realities of our life, right? Actually separates and causes a constriction of the heart so that teaching of emptiness is actually expansive and a willingness and it allows this willingness to be with all of life even those moments in my heart that I don't that I'm not proud of right those moments in my experience when I feel something that I don't want to admit right repulsion or blame or judgment or obvious things The Buddha described his experience saying, the vanity of youth, health, and life left me before I realized that I too am subject to old age, sickness, and death. Before this understanding arose, he was aghast when he saw someone bent over, aged and wrinkled and blotched skin and gray hair. He was distressed by sickness and horrified when he encountered death. Like us, he didn't want to acknowledge that death is always before us. However, when the truth of impermanence penetrated his heart, he realized that he was no exception. He was ashamed of his reaction. Everyone forgets that they will too age, 
even while confronted with the aged. On the full acknowledgement of his common destiny, the question in, arose in the Buddha-to-be, what is not subject to sickness, old age, and death? What is secure, truly stable, and truly peaceful? Is there anything that transcends death? And he also said something like, the Buddha also said something like, all things merge into the deathless. So this is an exploration of nibbana, or freedom, of the deepest kind of freedom, this freedom from, the deepest freedom from self-centered views, from a self-centered reality, from taking things personally, and the freedom of clinging in our heart. And so this all things merge into the deathless. This is pointing to how we don't have to transcend our life to taste emptiness. All experience, we can understand our experience. We can deepen our understanding of all experience, thoughts, ordinary experiences, body sensations, thoughts, emotions, relationships, society. We can understand our experience with all of this in a way that helps us or supports us in deepening into this reality of emptiness. So when we say emptiness, in what way are things empty? What might be what one question that we ask. And we might say that experience is empty of inherent, of absolute inherent meaning. So this is something the mind does, right? When I mentioned before that the mind creates our reality, the mind generates thoughts that become words and actions and contributions to society. So structures and forces have begun with this simple reality of the mind preceding thoughts, intentions and thoughts and you know, supporting all of the things that we do. So when I say that the experience is em empty of absolute meaning, we might see how mind is right is involved in making meaning all of the time, right? This mind, your mind, our minds are always making meaning. We are generating thoughts and ideas. We're la labeling things like this is a computer. These are people. I know some of you. I can call you by name, right? This is my body, my body. This is my glass. This is my home, whatever, you know. We're always not just naming things, but they mean something to us, right? They're pleasant or unpleasant to begin with. And they're connected, either intimately connected or not intimately connected. I um, came into my office this morning, yesterday morning, I think, and um, here where I teach from, and um, I noticed the curtains that are right back there, and I thought, hmm, those aren't. I thought, those are ugly. That's the thought that went through my head. That's honest. <laughs> and I remembered, like, I caught that. And I was like, oh, that's so interesting. Because I remembered this feeling of being here, like, tonight. And it's cozy. And I've got a blanket. And I'm warm. And the feeling of being in this office is different. Right? So the curtains actually don't bother me right now. But the mind was, like, making something out of this experience of seeing something hanging and called it ugly, right? And how wishy-washy this mind can be when one moment the curtains are bothersome and in another moment the curtains not bothersome, right? But they're in part not bothersome because of the total feeling I have being in this office right now and being with you 
perhaps. This is a nice feeling. It's good to be here. I enjoy uh, talking to you and hearing from you. And mostly you're listening to me right now, but your turn will come. But it is still enjoyable to be together. And so another way that we might answer that question, in what way are, is experience empty? We might say that experience is empty of projections, is in, is, and that's something that this mind does that layers onto experience. So we have these uh, ways of describing ourselves, like I work, I'm a social worker, I'm a partner, I'm a teacher, and yet we can see that, you know, in moments there's a question mark in my mind about how, to what extent that, uh, to what ex you know, how far does that identity reach? So, you know, I've been in many situations where, uh, where I've been um, with, out, like at the pool with my God kids. And I run into someone I know, either from social work or from Dharma teaching. And this question arises in my mind, like, oh, wait, here we are. Am I a Dharma teacher right now? Am I a social worker right now? Or am I just a person with their kids at the pool? Right? And this is just normal territory for the mind. So it's not like when there's a projection being placed on us, or when we're the one projecting something onto each other, that we're that there's a problem with somebody, right? It's not that at all. But our job is to wake up to this is what the mind does. The mind makes meaning out of everything. It constructs opinions and views and likes and dislikes and is terribly wishy-washy. One day it's like this and one day it's like that and is really determined by um, a myriad conditions, some that are visible to us and some that are invisible to us. And, you know, has this whole force is in motion here when with um, the way we play with projections as well. I was remembering um, this when I was little, when I was four years old, I I was sick and I was very sick and I, and I was in the hospital for about a week. And um, ever since then, when I go into a hospital, I have this feeling. It's a really sobering feeling. It's not like a felt sense in the body that, you know, there's this in, uh, instinct to, to settle, to get still, to like be quiet and pay attention like this is a sacred place. And often I'll have the image of Children's Hospital in Fresno, California, where I lived. And, you know, that I can still imagine the corridor, right, when you walk in and the doors that open on their own and the desk as if, you know, it's a reality now. But that certainly informs that projection of that experience when I was sick and a young child informs how this mind relates to a new experience today, walking into a hospital and all of those feelings that arrive. And another common way um, of so one thing that I've noticed about projections is the way that in this complicated reality that we're living in now with the stay at home order and more, um, you know, how this the mind can feel over overwhelmed so easily overwhelmed, at least for me. I don't know. Is anybody else overwhelmed in some moments by stuff? <laughs> Life, pandemic racial injustice, you know, pick any number of things. Um, I can feel uh, like overwhelmed by the immensity of suffering and um, what to do about that, right? How do I, what, what's my role? What do I do? And I notice that happening in very ordinary ways with work. So uh, I had a meeting coming up. I expected it to be very contentious and I was sort of dreading it. And so I was noticing that feeling of like, oh, you know, this is going to be hard. I'm going to have a big role. Um, 
I don't know what's going to happen. I, I want to be skillful. I don't know if I'm gonna. <laughs> All of this, you know, arising in the mind, just like this, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. Right? And the meeting actually went very differently. But I've been tracking this similar experience with, you know, a lot of things, work-related, meetings here, meetings there, activities, engagements, and noticing how that attitude really changes the quality of the experience, right? Sometimes I can notice this attitude that's influencing the way I am with my partner, right? I just feel, I have this uh, feeling of, uh, judgment or woundedness and I'm carrying that with me into various communications with her and uh, sort of projecting that onto the current situation and it's not it's it doesn't really relate to what's happening in real time right and because it is a strength and and changes the quality of my mind, my attitude, it certainly influences the quality of our togetherness, right? And that certainly has impact on the next moment and the next day and the next week. And so this, it is really uh, important for us to practice deepening our understanding into these ways that the mind misconstrues reality misconstrues the nature of experience by projecting and meaning making and um, influencing and how that influences right now. And so those times when we kind of rest into the mystery of causes and conditions and how things came to be, especially when we're considering what might be invisible to us, we can kind of have a lot of, have that same sobering feeling of like, wow, you know, there's there's certainly many moments that have contributed to this, hundreds of thousands of them, right? And from the very minute to the more expressive, like the minute intention or attitude that influenced the thought, that influenced the words, that influenced the action or the response to another human being. And another way that we might answer that question, um, experience is empty of what? You might say that experience is empty of self. And the paradox is that this doesn't negate our identities or our lived experiences. It just means that we misinterpret what's actually happening here. We miss these components and we, the mind naturally creates meaning by calling it something that we can understand, like a Shelley makes sense right now, especially when this mind isn't trained to see projection happening and meaning making happening and thoughts that are coming and going and dissolving like energy. Instead, this mind then makes something up that will help us feel or help me feel, help you feel, help us all feel like we can keep going forward. Like, oh, I get this, right? Our minds want to be able to get it. But emptiness, but when we rest into a deeper understanding of emptiness, emptiness is really inclusive. So like I already said, that all of our habits, all of our habits, the skillful habits we have, the unskillful habits we have, all of our identities and the body, our bodies just the way that they are, this is all a part of our nature. And nature at a deep level is all that there is. It isn't Shelley's world, unfortunately, or any of yours. <laughs> this is just nature, and we don't see that very often, right? It's rare that we look outside and notice change 
or notice coming and going, birth and death. What we see is wind and trees, and we call it beautiful or not beautiful, or, you know, sometimes we project something onto the experience that we're seeing even in the natural world, like uh, winter's just out to get me, or something like that, feeling betrayed by regular experiences like this. So it's really easy right, to see how to see how this works. But it's actually, you know, if we looked out at the trees and the wind and the dew or the snow or whatever we're noticing and saw mysterious processes, wow, oh, and just kind of, you know, landed there without feeling like we had something to fight without feeling like we needed to resist that in some way. When that happens, then this heart is so much more expansive and so much more capable and so much more free to express its true nature, which is something in line with compassion. At least that's the way it feels to me. When my heart can stop creating an enemy out of my partner and really see us both as a force of nature, a result of all of our previous conditioning and patterning, and this really complicated, messy moment couldn't be anything other than the way that it is because of that, my heart just breaks. Like, oh yes, this is another being, and this is really hard to be in relationship because of all of this. And I really care deeply about that. So this is the heart of emptiness and it allows us this possibility to see ourselves and each other in the world in a very different way. It can feel confusing, like what is this? Like not a self, but you know, just a process or projections and meaning making, but not a Shelley, what are you talking about? It can feel complicated, but we can go back to that previous intention that we can, uh, you know, renew again and again this intention to be sincere in our practice without any force or demand and just see, you know, what this is all about. What's it like in a moment to, we can practice this, you know, even you like your heart doesn't have to have arrived at a really enlightened place. But in an ordinary moment with someone you care about, you can just practice being right there in the field with them, tracking your mind, tracking what's going on in the conversation, and just see if you can see both of you as a force of nature and see what, what is there when you're doing that activity. It's really hard to hate. And it's easy to stay engaged. It's not at all depleting. This feeling like I don't know what to do with the state of things, you know, I can regularly feel like this. I don't know what to do. Like, there's so much injustice that's going on every day. And, but actually, when I'm there, when I'm there with that and moving and engaging and talking or acting or participating in something with this understanding of emptiness or nature, it feels quite easy and really beautiful to see what human beings who are have a shared vision can do together and the creativity that emerges and even the messiness is there like all the forces of unskillfulness like yeah this is what it's like to be emptying we all have unskillful habits that we're working through and this is what how grateful can we be to have a practice that allows us some path to keep doing that work it is hard this is the force of delusion and greed and hatred that flow through every human heart. And it can be painful to see like, oh yeah, this is what is emerging in the collective or has emerged in the collective since the inception of this country in very specific ways.
And so that willingness for the heart to touch and see experience at with the depth of understanding that we develop moment to moment in our mindfulness practice is really quite beautiful and is not at all depleting. It's very spacious, it's energizing, and it really supports us in our ongoing engagement. I was reading an article that Tara Brock wrote some time ago, actually, and in it she quoted um, Rainer Maria Rilke, which is a very short passage. It's here in all the pieces of my shame that now I find myself again. I yearn to belong to something, to be contained in an all-embracing mind that sees me. I just found that to be a beautiful expression of belonging that is at the heart of this understanding of emptiness and this desire that we all have to belong it can start right here with ourselves and how we accept and include every aspect of who we are all of the aspects of our heart mind body experience the activity of mind the thoughts even when they don't please us or make us proud of ourselves Right? This all gets to be included in our understanding of emptiness and nature, the force of which is propelling us all. Well, thank you for your kind attention tonight, everyone. I always like to leave a little time to hear from each other or to stop talking and to hear from you and i think it's wonderful that we get to hear from each other so if you have something to contribute please don't hesitate and remember it does not have to be well scripted or wise or anything it can just be uh, your intuitive sincere offering that helps us all grow in understanding of what it means to be human so please unmute yourself whenever you'd like and contribute. If we've been practicing a long time, we can have these views about the, like, you know, like Ashley was saying, like, uh, for some time, you know, when I'm more enlightened or more awakened, then maybe I'll understand that. But we want to really see the path as the fruit. So at every moment that we deepen into an understanding and use the really ordinary fabric of our lives and our relationships and our engagements as ways to feel into like what it means. What does emptiness mean? Oh, freedom of expression or inclusion of these bad habits or whatever it is. Yeah, thank you. To really stay um, open to the invisible forces that contribute to our ways of responding right? because there are so many so many complicated scenarios that we can consider i was just you know going through the precepts and earlier today and just remembering how like each precept is a training it's not a rule right there's this these trainings around non-harming to support us but there are many ways to think about and misunderstand action, right? So I was remembering um, an, an experience I had. I was doing a, a visit with a, a person I was, a family that I was working with and their family was celebrating a birth. Uh, they were celebrating a birth and so they had um, a deer meat stew and this was a traditional way of celebrating a birth and their indigenous culture and it was a beautiful like for them a way of being in relationship with land and relationship with life that they um you know killed and ate and used all parts of the animal in these really ceremonial ways 
so just the you know just like appreciating all of it that there's both this call to ethical living and the mind still constructs views and opinions about that get in the way of um, under of really being in a relationship of practice with the precepts or with our training or with our lived experience like oh there are lots of forces and we don't want to get locked in to like oh this is the way or this is the way but really to stay in a healthy relationship with our uh, practicing with our learning with our growing so that we don't land in a place of I got this but uh, deepening understanding deepening We end our time here together performing this wonderful act of imaginative generosity called sharing the merit in which we offer whatever goodness we've had um, freely. We sort of empty ourselves of that goodness and just offer it. So just taking that moment to Imagine that whatever benefit has occurred to us tonight, whatever blessing, whatever merit, we would happily, gladly, joyfully share it with others. We would even give it all away, every bit of it, to our parents, our teachers, our friends, families, maybe our coworkers, our community, persons known and unknown, to those who are thinking about particularly tonight, people who are suffering from the pandemic, people who are frontline workers, people who are working for racial justice, just in your own mind, imagine all those persons you'd like to offer this to. And then not only the persons, to the winged and the four-legged, the furry, the scaly, all those beings, known and unknown, we offer to share whatever blessings we have May all beings be at ease and may all beings find their way to a path of peace. So good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Patrice. Thanks, everyone, for being here.